like to welcome you all to this Sunday morning service at Faith Presbyterian Church here in Long Beach. Praise God for his uh, design upon us that we might uh, worship him here this day. And I thank you all for uh, being able to make it here. Welcome to our church. We have uh, a very busy summer season. And uh, I'd like to read you some highlights, which you can also read for yourself and follow along. But let me, uh, let me real quickly run through this. Ladies' prayer meeting today in the library. Those of you that go, please uh, uh, meet at 1220. Um, there's a nursery work day to uh, clean the toys. Uh, all toddlers are just like pigeons. They carry so much disease and spread it readily. Uh, the women's uh, Bible study group will be at Mary Fromm's uh, for a season so that Beth can be packed and ready to go see Jane's babies born. Uh, the fridge has stuff in it. Some of it belongs to you. Please make it be somewhere else, preferably your house. And uh, we need the room. Our vacation Bible school has, has continued to be quite uh, well attended and there's food involved. Not the reason it's well attended, I understand, but nonetheless, uh, it does help. There are some flyers left on the table uh, under the calendar by the three-way intersection there where the hallways and the doorways are. Uh, and uh, if you have the time and would make the time to go and pass those flares out, there are maps inside. Prayer request for VBS uh, as it gets ready to start in a week from tomorrow. And uh, please continue to pray uh, in, in fervent prayer for our outreach. This is uh, why we're here in this community, that we might uh, see the word of God uh, reach our neighbors. Uh, James is starting a, a campus uh, outreach at Long Beach City College on July 22nd. And uh, if you can come, uh, please do to help with the uh, 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 answering of questions. James, it's, it's the thing where you, you speak and we hang out in the crowd. And, yeah, so uh, we used to do this with uh, others in Santa Monica. There is uh, uh, one more on page nine, and it is a special request for our short-term mission uh, to uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, you can see that, that uh, it's, it's, a, it's at least a four-part effort, and um, pray that the Farnix and those people that we send from all over this country, uh, this is, this is an uh, interesting group this year because uh, they actually are coming from uh, all, all across the country and places in, in the middle. Uh, we often have a very large group from Southern California, but this time it's been pretty fair traded. So that, that's a blessing that our young people that are going would be able to meet other believers and also that they would be able to work together for the furtherance of the gospel. Let me read to you from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are in his also. The sea is his for he has made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, I'm sorry, the Lord our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray together. Lord God, I ask that you would watch over our worship today, Lord. Allow us to cast off all the worries of the coming of the day and the previous parts of this day that we might have a single effort to bring you praise and honor and glory. And please bless this time that we're here together for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's uh, start with the opening uh, song praise on page two. Come and come praise and glorify. If you would all rise, if you're able.
sing, Oh, How Good It Is. Please uh, turn in your red Trinity hymnal on the pew in front of you to page 846 and let us recite together the Nicene Creed. Odds are low that you know it by heart, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to, uh, to get there. Page 846. People of God, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of gods, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary 
and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And when we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we'll now hear from the choir they will sing, uh, May the mind of Christ my Savior. Your church is dismissed at this time. And if you would gather your hearts together with me to pray to our God. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we are often so unaware of all that you do and all that you are. Our world causes us to speed by the, the beauty and the glory and the majesty of you, but Lord, that we might line out some of the things that we do in fact see. This creation that you've made, the beauty of green and blue and all the colors in between, Father, that you've made for just happiness and beauty and 
tremendous gift that we have here in just the created earth. Father, that you make all that we see and touch and feel and hear and smell. And Father, that you make it for your glory. Father, that you give us an opportunity to bask in that glory. Lord God, we thank you for how you have made us as culturally able to uh, enjoy this life through some of the beauties and the great things that you've built, but also internally, Lord, that you've given us a desire for you, that you've caused us to reach up, that you've caused us to call you Father, that you've given us a heart that is regenerated and, and supple in your hand, and Father, that you've given us work both here on earth and then, of course, uh, for your kingdom. Father, that you've given us family and friends, that you've given us siblings and loved ones, that you've given us church family and opportunity to speak of you. And Father, poor servants as we are, that you still give us these opportunities. The fact that we fail at our duties, you still call upon us to do them. Lord God, you are a merciful and wise and glorious God, beautiful and eternal. That you see and hear and recognize all that we think, say, and do, that you answer our prayers, that you give us help and healing, that you work upon us for our sanctification, that you give us trials that we might be sifted, that we might be melted and reformed, that we might be built into something new and better. And God, you do all these things for us. Father, I pray that we'd be more thankful, more grateful, Lord God, I pray that you would cause us to not lag in our duties as your servants. Father, we have such an ability to disregard and in, that, in essence disrespect what it is that you've done. Lord God, this week alone, we have forgotten you. We have taken your name either in tacit or active uh, disapproval of the throne of grace. We have said and done things in our heart and our mind toward our brother or toward the people that you created. We have aggressed upon others. We have been proud, puffed up and haughty. We have said, I deserve better. And we have said it often. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to ask for forgiveness for these sins, both the active and the passive sins. Lord, there's no difference. You see them all as those things that need to be corrected. And without your power, Lord, without your grace, we can correct not the singlest one, not the tiniest bit, but you, Lord, you give us the gift. You give us the skill. You give us the strength. So bring more often to our hearts those things that we say and those things that we think and those things that we do and the hurtful things and the disrespectful things. Please, please make us better. Lord God, I pray for those people in our body that have the inability to be here because of age and infirmity, that are not able to be here because of difficulty in their mind and their heart. Father, I pray for those people that have separated from us because the suffering that they're under they don't see you as an answer. Father, we have lost people that we thought were solid in their faith, and yet they've walked away from you. Lord God, I pray that you'd bring them back. Father, for those that are unable to come, that are in their, in their waning years, I pray that we would not forget them. Father, I thank you for the robust ministry we have in this church for those people that are unable to be here. I pray that you'd lift the workers up, keep them strong, there's nothing that the adversary would not do, Lord, to keep our people from doing their job. So, Lord, I pray that they be protected. Hedge them about with your angels, Lord, that they might be able to work hard in your kingdom for those people that love you. And, Lord God, I pray for the outreach of this church as we get ready to do vacation Bible school. I pray, Lord, that again, it's not the big stuff that does us in, Lord. It's the drive to church that does us in. It's all the little, all the little niggling details that we take offense to or that we're distracted by. Make those go away. Cause our people to be focused. 
give them gift and ability with the young people under their care. Cause their words to be rich and glorious that they might see and hear you. And especially, Lord, as the prayer in the bulletin says, please let the word of God do its job. Let us not get in the way of the word, Lord, but let it be given to the people that come here in a way that shows our reverence for it, our joy in it, our love for what you've given. Let us reflect what it is that you say in your word and let that be an example to the memory that they have of this place. Lord God, I pray for those people that are going away for short-term missions. I pray for our missionaries abroad. I pray that you would protect and defend them while they're there. I pray for our young people that are going, that they might learn both how to serve and what to say, and they would not be distracted by the uh, sparkly of being in another country. Lord God, I pray that you would give all of our people that speak the word with their hearts success. And Lord, that we might be a gospel-driven church. Father, I thank you for how you work in us. I thank you for the jobs you give us to do. I thank you for the way that you heal, guide, care for, watch over, protect, defend. There's nothing that you would not do, Lord, to keep us safe and in growing condition. Please, please Lord, take our thanks as a as a sweet savor to you and what you've done and what you do. Lord God, I pray for James today as he speaks the word of truth to us out of your word that you've given us. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would indwell this congregation richly, that our ears would be open, that our hearts would be well plowed for the receipt of this seed, that we might be able to be good, godly people because of the ministry that our pastor that you've given us would provide for us cause him to be rich in the words that he has to say to us and cause us to be well able to hear them. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be this day, in this place, your people, called to worship you and able to do so. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, please, to hymn 703. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the offering. Good thing we have a choir group still sitting up here. Would you, would you all, uh... hey, I didn't pray for the offering. Hang on one second, let's do it again, ready? Lord God, I ask that you'd bless this offering as our people prepare to give it. I pray that you'd place your blessing upon that which we give back for the mercies that you show us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Now the offering. All right, so I already launched the ending. Hymn 703, please, and if you're able, please stand. 
And let us sing the love with everlasting love together. morning. <clears throat> well, um, this morning uh, we begin a, a new series, and it's new, but at the same time it's a continuation. We'll be continuing, continuing through Paul's second letter to the, to the Thessalonians, because uh, <clears throat> uh, as we'll find out in a moment, a, uh, he hears some news after the writing of his first letter, and soon then wrote this second letter. So a lot of the same themes, a lot of the same circumstances, a lot of the same reasons um, are there for this second letter as there was his first letter. And I just thought, well, it's, it's a little bit, more, it's also convenient for me to just preach through both of these letters as almost as one letter. Um, so he received that another report after Timothy came back and gave him the report, which was the occasion for the first letter. And, uh, and so he hears some disturbing news. He hears that, that they have not taken to heart his first letter. And so he gives a little bit more forceful uh, uh, teaching in the second letter. And, um, and he... He gives them more specifics regarding uh, what's going to happen at the end when Jesus returns. And he gives them even some more practical, uh, practical words on how to live in light of 
of, that, of Jesus' return. And so you have to remember that Paul is writing to a very spiritually young and immature church that was susceptible to all kinds of false teaching. If you remember when I had uh, talked to you about the occasion for the Thessalonian church, that was when Paul preached for about four weeks in Thessalonica, and, and, uh, and that's when there were mobs that gathered because there were people who, who just abhorred his teaching and, uh, and they chased him out of Thessalonica. And it was only after four or five weeks, so it was a very young church. But Paul had done... He had laid a good foundation, but they needed some more, more uh, strengthening, and that's what these letters are about. Um, and so, so this morning I'm going to read just the first, um, maybe the first section of First Thessalonians, the first maybe four or five verses here. And so if you would open your Bibles with me, you can also follow along um, in, in the bulletin. And there's only the first couple of verses, but... Um, but I'll just read uh, the first four verses here in Second Thessalonians. And, and since, um, since the uh, word and the preaching have already been prayed for, hear now the reading of God's word, beginning in verse 1 of Paul's second letter. Paul, Savannah, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. And this is the reading of God's holy word. When my mom, uh, when I was little, my mom would drop, well, no, well, not when I was little, but when I was younger, probably elementary school, when I played Little League, my mom would drop me off at baseball practice, and uh, then she said, wait for me here, I'll come pick you up when it's done. And um, so sometimes she came early and, and waited for my practice to finish, because, you know, sometimes we went a little bit over. Sometimes she came right on time when practice ended, but sometimes she came just a little late because of traffic or, or, or whatever reason, or maybe we ended early and she, would, she was preparing to uh, pick me up on time. And so she wasn't quite there sometimes when I was done with practice. And when that would happen, I would do my best to sit and wait for her. Sometimes my friends would offer me rides home and, and sometimes, you know, I would, I would have to turn them down because, you know, if I wasn't here when my mom came, I would feel bad. And I'm sure my mom would think that, you know, uh, m maybe my mom would worry. And, um, <clears throat> but sometimes I would go to the playground on the other side of the park and I would forget to wait for her. That I uh, ignored some of the things that she said and, um, and, uh, and so I would play, and one time, you know, she had come to pick me up, and she saw that I wasn't there, and she drove away. And I'd be running. You'd see me from the other side of the park, just running, screaming, Mom, I'm here, I'm here. But she would already turn the corner, and she'd be gone. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I felt like she left me. I felt abandoned. Uh, I just started crying. I just started crying and crying, and, and it was getting dark. It was a long, long walk home. Uh, I just stood there and, and just, just bawled my eyes out. I felt so abandoned and alone. And I would say to myself, you know, if only, you know, through the tears, <laughs> if only I'd waited for her, if only I didn't go off and play. She thought I was gone, and I should have waited for her. And, and, um, and this must have been, in some way, this must have been a little bit of how the Thessalonians must have felt when they heard from false teachers that Jesus had already come and gone. They must have felt abandoned and alone. Uh, they must have wondered what they had done that Jesus had left them behind. 
And so what do they, knew, what do, they do now? This was, must have been the burning question in their minds and in their hearts. And this is what Paul's second letter is, is, is all about. It's about standing firm in the hope of Jesus' coming return and, and what that means for Christians. Even when, when there are false teachers that tell you that, that Jesus has already come or maybe Jesus is, will never come, Paul writes the truth of the gospel that Jesus is coming back. And we can, we can be rest assured and not feel abandoned or lost and alone. So let me introduce 2 Thessalonians, and then I'll conclude with just a few remarks uh, on the first uh, two verses here. So who wrote the letter? Of course, you know, look at verse 1. You can follow along with me. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Um, Paul wrote it, but he is writing also, you know, as, as a, a missionary team with Silvanus and Timothy. And this means that he wrote it very soon after his first letter. Because if you look at the beginning of, of Paul's first letter, the same three names are there. That means that, that they're still together and they haven't separated yet. And, and, they haven't, and Paul hasn't sent Timothy to uh, other churches to pastor them. And so they're still together. And that puts the letter around 49, 51 AD, right there in the middle. Uh, and he probably wrote it while he was still in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, after the first letter, Paul got wind that the Thessalonians have, 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 been, uh, have succumbed to some false teachers who've been giving them false teaching that Jesus had already come back and is gone, and that they were left behind, so to speak. And so they didn't see the point one of the implications of, of this false teaching is that they did not see the point of continuing to work and live productive lives in obedience to Christ. That if, 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 if Jesus already came and gone, you know, what's the point of, of living for Jesus if he's not going to come and take them home? So there are implications for false teaching in the church, and Paul's going to correct that. He's going to address that. Um, and and it seems like they did not take to heart Paul's, Paul's explicit teachings and corrections in the first letter, that Jesus is coming back, and this is what's going to happen. He wrote er, er, earlier in 1 Thessalonians that when Jesus comes back, they don't, they don't have to be afraid, because when he comes back, all the Christians who have died in the Lord will rise from the dead and that together, Paul says, we will all meet the Lord in the air. And, uh, and it seems like they haven't really taken that to heart. And so, so Paul writes here again in, first Thess in Second Thessalonians that until Jesus returns, um, they have to work hard for the Lord because he is coming back. He hasn't already come. He is coming and to love one another as they are presently doing, but to do so more and more. That's what we read here uh, in these first uh, uh, section. And to live lives with our aim to please God, doing it all more and more. And in the meantime, um, uh, he tells them that, that uh, no one will know when Jesus comes back, right? Like a thief in the night, he wrote but to live by faith in joyful obedience and perseverance, waiting until Jesus comes back. Um, but it turns out that they, they may have ignored or minimized that first letter. Maybe they, they didn't believe Paul, and so Paul writes them another one. And so he wrote 2 Thessalonians to remind them uh, again of the good news that Jesus is yet to come and that we ought to wait patiently and productively for him. And particularly then in their suffering and persecution, they have the assurance of that sure return that, that Jesus will rescue them and he will put everything aright. That all those who persecute them will be punished and those who are being persecuted will be uh, exalted, will be, will be, everything will be um, brought back to its just end. 
and that we can stand firm, they can stand firm in this certain hope. So what are some of the key themes that we're going to look at as we go through 2 Thessalonians? What did Paul tell the Thessalonians that they needed to hear, and in turn what you and I need to hear? Again, this is a reminder that though this book was written 2,000 years ago, it still is completely relevant for our lives. Yes, culture, the particulars of culture and society has changed, but God doesn't change. His truth doesn't change. Our problem of sin hasn't changed. Our unbelief and struggles haven't changed. Our need for a Savior will never change. Why? Because Paul wrote in in another part of, of Scripture, because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And therefore, when we hear these gospel, timeless truths, they transcend change and history. They are directly relevant to us in our culture and our, in our circumstances today. It may look, the application may look different, but the truth is still relevant. Their same sins and unbelief and struggles and sufferings and persecution are the same for us. That's why the good news, uh, it's not good news only for them 2,000 years ago, but it's good news for us today. And, and so here are the three key themes that we're going to look, th- look at as we go through Second Thessalonians. These are the key themes that we need to hear today. First, we need to live in light of Jesus' coming return. This was the same theme that we read in First Thessalonians, and Paul continues it here in second. He reassures the Thessalonians that Jesus is coming, and don't believe the rumors. Don't believe the rumors that he's already come or that he's not coming. He is coming. They don't need to be afraid that they've missed out on that return and that God has not left them behind. This might be why Paul goes into more detail regarding the chronology and the sequence of events uh, leading up to Jesus' return. This is where we get the idea of, of the Antichrist and the man of lawlessness and the mystery and the spirit of lawlessness, that there are certain things that we will experience in history, and that if we, if we are in the midst of experiencing those things, then Jesus will come soon after. Now, the, the question of what, what soon means is, you know, we're not sure, but uh, if we're, if, it, what we're going to see is that if we're suffering persecution, that's part of of the sequence of events. So Jesus hasn't returned yet because we're still being persecuted. Do you see? That that in the midst of our suffering, there's hope. That this persecution isn't going to go on forever and ever, but it's going to end, and it's going to end when Jesus comes back. So we we have hope in the midst of our trials. And um, and then in chapter 2, he tells us, he gives us um, the... Those ev- some of the particular events the, of the rebellion of the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, you know, th- this, this theme that, that, that there is going to be uh, an, a one who opposes the Lord and his gospel and his Christ and his people, and the spirit of that opposition is going to play out in the culture and in society. And we're going to look at that. And, uh, and, and just to ma- let me just make a, uh, one comment here, that there's been a whole cottage industry in evangelical Christianity uh, as to looking at particular events that we're experiencing now and, con- and connecting them to, to some of these passages. And what I would, would say in answer to that is, um, maybe you can think of what Paul writes here as themes for what will happen in history, right? Themes of what, of the spirit of what Paul is, is describing here as the man of lawlessness and the spirit of, of the Antichrist as a theme of, of the whole of history. And, uh, and that there, there, there may come a time when, when there is one person, but, but uh, as we'll, we'll see later on in, 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 in other writings of Paul, 
that the man of lawlessness, that the, that the spirit of the Antichrist has already come. So we're going to look at what that means too. So that, in other words, so we don't get caught up in looking at events and saying, ah, you know, um, you know this, this means exactly this. And therefore, it's going to be an exact sequence of events. Um, just think of it as the themes that will lead up to, to when Jesus returns. And we don't know exactly when that is, but we're experiencing it now. And then in chapter 3, in light of all that he writes regarding the revelation of the coming of Christ and the rebellion of the Antichrist, he tells us then, in the meantime, before, until Jesus comes, here are the responsibilities of Christians in light of, of those end-time sequences. In light of Jesus' return, Paul tells us, how then should we live? And he says things like work, work and live, uh, live, uh, work quiet and peaceable lives, uh, echoing other parts of Scripture. These are how we ought to live, and we're going to look at that as well, because it's directly uh, applicable to us today. Uh, a second theme is that we need to prepare and not be surprised for the opposition that we are going to experience from the world. That if, if the Lord tells us that we're going to suffer, he tells us that so that we can not be surprised and not, be, not lose heart, but to persevere in the midst of that suffering. That you have to remember that Paul is writing to a persecuted church suffering the same opposition that, that the Thessalonians had, had given him when they chased him out of Thessalonica. And, and the church, the believers that are still there, are experiencing that same opposition. They've lost their freedoms, their jobs, their livelihoods, their rights, maybe even their families and their homes. All because they wanted to follow Jesus. And this is why Paul says in verse 4, Therefore we boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the inflictions that you are enduring. See, here's what Paul is celebrating in these first four verses, is that they're, they're undergoing intense persecution. Way more persecution than you and I ever will encounter, at least in our lifetime, in the past and maybe in, in, the, in the near future. But other areas, other countries throughout the world, to become a Christian is certain death. Death on the spot. Death without trial, death without a jury, instant death, stoning, decapitation, or maybe even less um, direct persecution, but being thrown in jail, being tortured, being beaten, being hated, being shunned. And, and so the same kinds of persecutions are are being experienced in Thessalonica, and they are standing firm. And so the, the Apostle Paul is going to write to us how they can continue to stand firm. Don't we all need to hear that? Right? I mean, sometimes we, 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 uh, we fold and we crumble even at the, at, a, at the slightest glance of mocking. And so if we, if we crumble at that, I mean, you know, imagine... What, what would be if, if uh, there was a gun put to our heads? You know, how do we stand firm? And, um, and in this way, I think, we, we have a lot to learn from, from the churches throughout the world. We have it really good here in America. We have it really, really good. But imagine, you know, having to make the choice. Do you want to follow Jesus or do you want to keep your job? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to keep your home? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to keep your family? Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to keep your life? The Apostle Paul is going to help us understand how to stand firm so that when Jesus comes back, we won't be ashamed. <clears throat> and then... Uh, and so Paul writes later on in the letter, he says, So then, brothers, Paul says, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, 
either by a spo- our spoken word or by our letter. And here we see both. The spoken word and turned into a letter. And that's what we need to hear. And thirdly, the third key theme is we need to live in light of the end times. Uh, just as in Paul's first letter, we need to live by faith that Jesus is coming back and that that ought to be the perspective that, that helps us understand what's going on in the present. In other words, the future, what, what we know is going to happen in the future ought to inform the way that we live in the present. And if we live by faith, trusting that, that Jesus is going to come back, and that God's final judgment is coming, then it's going to change the way that we live, the decisions that we make, and the priorities that we have in our lives. We won't look to the things of this world and of our lives as ultimate ends in themselves. That there is going to be an end uh, to this present reality as we know it. And therefore, we, we ought not to... to uh, to put, put stock and pour our whole lives and our hopes into the things of this world that can fade away in a moment's notice. That Paul, the, the Apostle Paul is helping, is pointing us to something more eternal, something more unchangeable. To put our, to store up treasures for ourselves in heaven where moths cannot eat, rust cannot eat away to, uh, to, to disintegrate, and thieves cannot steal. So we won't be tempted to see Um, our lives in this present uh, time in history as as the be-all, end-all of our lives, but see them as temporary and fleeting and looking forward to that which is eternal and never-ending. We won't look to, to our jobs. We won't look to our possessions. We won't look to our reputations, our standing in the community. We won't look to ourselves for our own peace and security, we'll look only to the eternal things of God, keeping our minds uh, fixed upon the things above and not on things below. We will look forward to those eternal things of God when Jesus re- will return. But until then, Paul says then, we can live and work quiet, quietly and to earn our own living. And then, because we know all these things are going to be true, we will not grow weary in doing good. Uh, that the things, I, I love that, that scene, that scene in, um, in Gladiator where, where at the beginning um, the general says, you know, the things that we do today echo into eternity. And I think, you know, from a Christian point of view, that's, that's true. The things that we do have eternal consequences and significance. That someone, for example, and then I'll say this, someone shared the gospel with you you were born into a Christian home. Someone shared the gospel with you. You repented and put your faith in Jesus Christ and God forgave you of your sins and you were accepted and adopted into God's family, given new and eternal life. That very, that very act itself echoes in history in your own life. That you have eternal life because someone did something in light of, of eternity for you. And so God calls us then to live, then, to make our own decisions, to, to, do, to do that which God calls us to do so that those things, too, can echo into all of eternity. And, um, and when Jesus comes back, all of those things will be brought to light, brought to the fore, where something like uh, where Jesus, in the parable of, of the faithful servant, you know, those who are faithful over little, then God, Jesus says, you will be faithful over much. And on that judgment day, he will say, then now enter into the joy of your master. You were faithful in the little things that you were given today. And, uh, and, and, and God will be pleased uh, for all eternity for them. This is important because... The Christian, and, and here, here's, uh, here's one of the things that I think um, we, we, can, we shouldn't take for granted here in First and, Thec- and Second Thessalonians, is that, that unlike other religions and, and other philosophies and worldviews of the day, Christianity had a, what we call a linear unfolding of history 
and providence. That there is, and, and I'm going to use a big word, and I'll explain it in a moment, that there is an eschatological view of history. In other words, history is linear and there is a goal and an end to history. That the things that happen in history are leading up to a, a climax and an, an end. And that end goes on forever and ever. Whereas the world, the religions and the, hist and the philosophies of the day, and including today in our own culture and in our own worldview, is that history is circular. History is circular. There is no linear unfolding. There's no beginning and an end. It's circular over and over again. Right? There was, there's there's the, the reincarnation of the Eastern religions. Um, there's this uh, idea that... that, um, uh, that that there is no unfolding plan or, or narrative to history. Uh, maybe the best way to, th to think about in a, in a popular way is, you know, when we say to our, our people, when we say to, you know, we say to our friends, you know, what goes around comes around. It is exactly that circular view of history where we're trapped in this, this, uh, this hamster wheel of, of life and of, of time and, and of, of uh, sequence. And it's just go around and around over and over again. But what makes Christianity absolutely unique and what I think we here in, in Western, um, uh, formerly more Christian uh, uh, old, uh, outlooks is that history has a, an arc. History has a story. History has an end. It's not an infinite circle. And therefore there is hope you know, at the end of history. Right? That when things are going badly, God tells us that at the end of history, there is hope. Um, and, and so, if you don't have this Christian view of history, uh, what happens is, you know, and, and, you know, is that uh, worldviews and philosophies that, that do not have this Christian view of history... Uh, and there is no God in control of, of the narrative of, of the world and of our lives, then what happens is there's an existentialist nihilism sets in and all of history becomes pointless and meaningless. That there is no goal of, of hope and of glorification of perfection as a climax to history. And therefore then, you know... Um, you know, if, if evil prevails in a particular culture or society, there's, there, there, there is logically, intellectually no hope for, there's no hope, there's no guarantee that, that the evil prevalent uh, in, like, say, for example, uh, uh, a structural or institutional uh, injustice will ever end. Right? But it's only in a worldview where, where God you know, is in control, that there is an end to history, is there hope for us to change things? And, um, and this is, uh, and I think this is interesting that when folks who don't believe in God or don't believe in a God who is in control of human history, and yet they advocate uh, for human and civil rights, they fight all kinds of injustice and evil, what the reason, the reasoning behind their advocate, advo advocating for, for justice against injustice, they'll quote someone like Martin Luther King Jr. Who, who would say a quote like this. He would say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. See, it presupposes the, 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 linear, the linear unfolding of history with an end, an end of justice, an end of righteousness, an end of hope. But if you don't have a belief in a God of history, then you can never, that, that, that particular saying makes no sense. Right? That when there is injustice, it will bend towards justice. Um, and so it presupposes a, a Christian understanding of history and morality, that there is an eschatology of history, an end to uh, the goal, uh, there is an end and goal of history that, that is with a goal of justice. And, um, and so history is not meaningless. In the gospel, the arc of the moral universe 
does and will bend towards justice. And it will come to its climax when Jesus returns, that all of human history finds its deepest and most satisfying end when he returns. That every wrong will be made right, every sadness turned into joy, every sickness into salvation, every death into life, every hunger will be satisfied, every thirst will be quenched for those who put their hope in him. That's the gospel of history from which we see in 2 Thessalonians and in the whole of Scripture. And this is why Paul begins his letter, a letter to a suffering and persecuted church, precisely the way in which he does. He reminds them of who they are and what they have from God, thereby reminding us that, uh, of who we are and what we have, so that when our story ends all together at the end of history, we can persevere through anything that comes in the meantime. This is why Paul tells us who we are, that we are a church in God our Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the gospel, Paul tells us that we have the grace and peace of the gospel from God who becomes our Father in the gospel. That we who are without hope, and we were orphans in the world, we now have a heavenly Father who watches over us as in control of all of history and, and, and loves us and has the best for us. And the way that we receive the grace and peace of God our Father is through His one and only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That through Him in the gospel we have the grace, the grace of God, salvation to us, given to us by grace, in grace, through grace, to be received as a gift, not to be earned as if we can do good works in order to receive it, but given freely because God loves us by his grace. And through that grace in Christ Jesus who died on the cross for our sins, that while you and I were sinners and we were enemies of God, Jesus took our sins and he suffered the wrath of God that enemies deserve. That he suffered the wrath that you and I should have received, and he suffered and he died for you and for me. But because our enmity, because our sins were once and for all done away with when Jesus died on the cross, we are accepted and forgiven once and for all for all of our sins. And because we are accepted, we are then adopted into God's family. We become God's sons and daughters. We have peace with God. And it is this peace, this grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ then becomes the firm foundation and standing and truth by which then we can live the whole of the Christian life that takes away all of our fears, all of our anxieties, even when we suffer persecution. No matter what we go through, we can praise God that by grace He loves us and we have peace with God. That when He returns, we will be raised to eternal life and we will live with Him forever. And this is only a momentary affliction. That it, it, it cannot be compared to the eternal weight of glory that is to come. And so if we keep our eyes fixed upon that grace and peace in the gospel, then even in our, in our suffering, we can praise God. And if we can praise God through that pain, we can persevere all the way to the end. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this wonderful truth this wonderful truth of the grace and peace that we have from you, God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us then to let that be the foundational truth in our lives and of our lives, so that no matter what happens, uh, we can stand firm and confident to the very end. We ask, O oh Lord, all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, friends, uh, brothers and sisters, if you would turn in your hymnals with me to 699. We'll, we'll sing uh, Like a River Glorious. And if you would remain seated, seated 
and, and stand um, at the last stanza. That would be, that'd be wonderful. And, and the deacons now will, will uh, take up the uh, monthly deacons offering. This is, this is money that, and, and assistance that goes directly to the poor and needy of our church and in our community, separate from our usual giving. Six ninety nine. To the people of God, look up and hear now his benediction of peace to you. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And all of God's people said,